so I had a little time to think about episode two last night. This is one of the reasons I like doing the episodes over a, a few days rather than binging them all at once. And I have to say that the decision by Yi Win Jae to send that message to the aliens, the more I thought about it, the more it infuriated me. My reaction was sort of, how dare you? You've been warned that this, whoever you're talking to is dangerous, that this could be of very big consequence to the human race. And you take it upon yourself to invite them to come and conquer your own people. It also plugs into something that I've often had a problem with, which is environmental doomerism. The reason that she makes that decision is because you know, she's been traumatized by the Cultural Revolution, and she's also been in this area where she sees the environment being destroyed and decides that human beings can't handle themselves. We need someone to take care of us. And that is a sentiment that you'll occasionally see. And, and then at the time she makes that decision in the 1970s, there was a very great degree of environmental doomerism. You can see it in the science fiction of the time of things like Soylent Green, where you know, human race, humanity was doomed because of pollution and, and stuff like that. That turned out to be incredibly misguided. Um, many of the problems we had in the 1970s with the environment turned out to have solutions. Now, it involved work and effort, you know, but, but things are much better than they were back then. Now, you look at many of those things. I just talked about in my Eclipse video, Lake Erie was so polluted, people thought it was going to die, and now it's a palatable lake. You look at smog. When my parents were in Los Angeles when they were much younger than me. You could barely could breathe the air. Now they have very few smog days. And that's because we made an effort. We built catalytic converters. We had regulations. We cleaned things up. And the only, you know, most of the environmental issues have gotten way better in the last 50 years. You'll never hear that from some environmentalists because they don't like to acknowledge that progress can be made. They always like to have things in terms of doom and gloom. And there are, that's not to say there aren't serious issues, things like global warming and uh, deforestation and habitat loss are still very serious issues. But I have a lot of confidence in the ability of human race based on our track record of being able to eventually overcome these problems. Some of them, like global warming, are going to be a huge challenge. But if you look even just at global warming, in the United States, greenhouse gas emissions peaked like 15 years ago. They've been going down. And we have been making very big improvements in technology, and hopefully these breakthroughs that we've been having in nuclear fusion and things like that will uh, make you progress even more rapid. So yes, these are concerns, and there were concerns back then, but this idea that everything is a disaster and that we would need some alien intervention to save us from ourselves is a mentality that I personally dislike and disagree with on a scientific level, on a political level, and on a personal level. I, I don't think it's scientifically inaccurate of the series because I think it reflects a very real mentality. And I think don't think it's a bad thing on a story level because she gets to that point through a series of life experiences. So I, I like the writing. I like what it's doing here. And I think it's a, a sign of good writing that it provokes this kind of response in me. The other thing I, I was thinking of when I was rolling around in bed last night was that I think you and Jay whatever is going on, whatever conspiracy is going on to stop these scientists from doing research and stuff like that, she is clearly part of it. The reason I think that is because of the video game. When Jeff tries to, it's Jeff, right? Not Jack. When Jack tries to use the video game that Jin is using, it he's attacked and he can't use it. It is clearly personalized to individual people to give them an individual experience that will do whatever the video game is trying to accomplish, make them communicate, turn them into secret agents, whatever it's trying to do. And so when you and Jay says, oh, my daughter was playing this video game, I just found it. I think she planted it there. I think it was a pretense to get her to play the video game so that she can be converted to whatever uh, group that you and Jay is, is involved in. So uh, a lot of thoughts. Uh, hopefully we'll get some more answers in episode three, but I think uh, we're probably still gonna be doing some uh, building of the plot here. Uh, my understanding is it's not till about midway through this season that we get some more explanations. So let's dive in with episode three of The Three Body Problem. CERN. I know that place. That's more particle accelerator stuff. It's been a difficult month at CERN. A half dozen projects suspended. Dr. Schmidt seemed to take it quite hard. 
Oppenheimer's mistress died the same way. On her knees, head in a tub. Something she was murdered. Maybe she just knew the kind of misery the world was about to face. That is true. If you saw the movie Oppenheimer, his mistress did commit suicide. Probably more because she had mental health issues than Have a conspiracy. look at what he's locked away. I, I'm really liking Benedict Wong in this series. It's a it's a different role from what he's played in the MCU, and I think he's killing it. Well, so someone broke in and left it here, and then you were like, "Oh, I should put this on me head." <laughs> I've got state of the art security. I've been through every camera feed. There's no sign of anyone coming in or out. You don't think that's alarming? Scrub from the footage, just like the woman who told me that the universe was going to blink at me? You can't compare this to unexplained cosmic phenomena. It's just not the same thing. Except it kind of is. Yep. The stars, all these countdown, this video game. They're all virtual realities indistinguishable from actual reality. The sword lady said we're supposed to use science to save the next civilization, right? So we need to come up with a way to predict the next stable era and how long it'll last. Christ, how much have you been playing? <laughs> Coffee spot. Keep a whiteboard in your flat. Yeah, that's my work. <laughs> You've got snacks of yours, don't you? You can't eat a whiteboard. I I'm sorry, this is just too on the nose. <laughs> but when you're stoned, or at least you shouldn't. Rudy, focus. Okay, so these are all the times I've played. I, this is too on the nose because I, you know, I, I am a fan of video games, and I have on this computer right here spreadsheets for Pokemon Go and other games that I play, you know, trying to optimize them and figure out how long it's going to take to farm this and how long it's going to take to farm that. So this is like looking into a mirror. Oh my God. <laughs> this is great. The only explanation for these observations is that this planet is part of a three body star system. That's the answer. If our planet revolves around one of the suns in a stable orbit, that's a stable era. However, if one of the other suns snatches our planet away, we wander through the gravitational fields of all three suns. That's a chaotic era. Silence. So what she's saying here is semi-accurate. It would really depend on the uh, configuration, but three body systems are inherently unstable. But we do know of situations where you could have a planet in a stable orbit in a triple system. If you had one of the stars very far out, like at the Alpha Centauri system, where Proxima Sen is pretty far out so it wouldn't disturb the inner planets that are around, or if they're very closely bound to their star, and even in a system like this, you wouldn't see one of the stars recede really fast like that where it would be noticeable. So a little bit of mix of accuracy and inaccuracy here. Why are we not dead too? Because we were right. So, I mean, it, they're in a virtual reality, obviously, but in a system where you had, where if you got too close to one of the stars, um, you would have the planet heat up and, and uh, become a desert. You wouldn't have things melting unless you had an enormous amount of seismic activity, which heat would not stir up. Slowly freezing until the Pakistani soldiers all came out and that's when I threw my grenade. I killed them all. And I took the oxygen and supplies from their camp back to my men. And we all survived. Wow. Yeah, that tiny wind. Can't help but think that story is going to be relevant at some point. The balance of the entire conflict. Well, Jin gets the highest civilian honor. Surviving dinner with the Varmas. Uh, <laughs> to Jin. To Aww. Jin. To Jin. Oh. 
That was nice. Hi, hi. There he is. It's kind of a relief when they have a scene where someone's meeting their uh, SO's parents and it's like nice instead of being like a horror show. So, well done, movie. There's our boy. Okay, we know we're in a three star system. We know we can't predict the motions of three bodies in space. Not for long. Classic three body problem. And there's famously no general solution for it. Unless, of course, you managed to whip one up on the tube ride over. That's true. Uh, when you have two bodies interacting gravitationally, uh, there is a very easy, straightforward solution using Newton's laws. When you have three bodies, the interactions become increasingly difficult. I'm not familiar enough with dynamics to know the ins and outs of it. There are ways to predict it using very sophisticated analysis and, and simulation uh, to get so. That's why we were able to send probes into the solar system with very high precision, because then you have a multi-body problem. But even in that case, you're being dominated by the sun and the Jupiter or whatever planet you're going to. So the three body problem as a general solution is just a formula you could plug numbers into does not exist. I've developed a science I call calculus to uh, predict the movement of the sun. Oh, well, that's Mark Gaddis. And these calculations are performed by my great human abacus. Run solar orbit computation software. Three body one point oh. Okay, that's cool. Jesus. All in a line. Assistance. So what? They're eclipsing one another. The planet is no hotter than it was before. What's happened to my army? Um, so that scene, while very dramatic and obviously has a purpose for the video game, physically is nonsense. You know, the idea is that you have the suns line up and their gravity is all lining up and that overrides the gravity of the Earth and pulls all these people up. Let's just take an Earth analog. The acceleration of Earth's gravity on the surface is 9.8 meters per second squared. The acceleration we feel from the sun is measured in millimeters per second squared. It's literally a thousand times less. So you could have all three stars, you could triple the size of the sun, and it would change Earth's orbit, obviously, but it would not start pulling things off the surface of the Earth unless we got so close to the sun that we got inside what's called the Roche limit, where so the sun's gravity overcomes it. We'd have to be pretty close to the surface of the sun, or maybe even inside the sun, depending on how massive the sun is and how massive the Earth is, uh, to, for that to, over, to be uh, the case. And in that case, you're going to start to get tidal distortions and things like that. Uh, it would be much more scientifically accurate if they wanted to show like massive tidal waves or something like that caused by the syzygy and the, and the gravitational force lining up. We, even then, it wouldn't be that strong. But uh, this while being very traumatic, is very scientifically inaccurate. Um, maybe on, ten, in per, on purpose, maybe they're trying to demonstrate this uh, for dramatic purposes, but no, you would not, unless you were like right on top of the star, in which case you the, being that close as gravity is the least of your problems, this would not happen. There will eventually be a cataclysm from which we cannot recover. Our planet will be ripped in half or pulled into one of the suns, or expelled into space forever. More or less accurate, yeah. The first person to make contact with them was from China, and Santi Ren reads three-body people. people in Chinese. And these Santi Ren, they're on their way here, coming from an unstable three-body star system, four light years away. Getting closer every moment. Four light years away, that would be Al Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is a triple system. 
but it's relatively stable. You have a binary system and then you have Proxima Senway out here. So maybe in this fictional universe, it's different, but that's not uh, uh, the system they're depicting here. So are they gonna kill Jack now? Get off my <laughs> All you had to do was keep playing. <laughs> initial thoughts. Uh, first of all, that was, I think, the best episode so far. We got a little bit of revelation. It had a flow to it. The others seemed to sort of like the kind of setting a lot of stuff up and finally we get uh, some payoff and some movement of the plot. Uh, as I said while I was watching it, what they say about the three-body problem is accurate. What they say about the Alpha Centauri system in particular is not accurate. That is a more stable system and uh, in fact, I'm working on a novel that's partly set on a stable planet around one of the stars of Alpha Centauri. The ending, and you sort of saw it coming, it was telegraphed, but I think that really uh, ties into how this series began in episode one, the fanaticism that we are seeing that whoever is working with the aliens has this uh, fanaticism about them that they will kill. They see everything in terms of saving these aliens and that makes me very suspicious of the aliens' motives and of the motives of the people who have called them, especially given that the initial invitation was to come and conquer us and save us from ourselves. And that's always a bad inclination. So uh, we will see how these develop over the next five episodes, but I am very uh, negatively inclined towards the uh, pro-alien faction uh, in whatever this is because of their fanaticism. And uh, I think that's... Uh, an interesting tie to how this began with the Cultural Revolution. So that's episode three in the can. Uh, I'm getting a little bit more used to this kind of live reaction. Uh, you're seeing me talk a little bit more and uh, hopefully I've got the angles now so I'm not looking down the whole time. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep going with this. Uh, I don't know when these are going to post. I'm filming these the week of uh, April 15th and uh, they'll probably see how it goes with the editing because they're going to be a beast to edit. But until uh, we talk again, I'm Mike Siegel. I write for Ordinary Times. Thank you for watching.